the, your brain first tells you like, oh my God, that's X, Y, Z. You can't do that. And then you er, hit the brakes. Hold on. What would it take to become the type of person that can? Okay. What does somebody who can do an 80 mile paddleboard or a 50 mile race? What do they do? What do they look like? What do they eat? Like it's all act, been done yeah. before. Like it's like, how often do they train? How often they've been injured? How long have they been doing this? And then you just put that together and all of a sudden this 50 mile race doesn't look as scary. You're still scared because there's yeah. a dose of like, it's binary pass or fail. But I think if more, and this is going way off on a limb, if more people had that mission and something that made them hesitate or pucker, but they did it anyway, I think that's how you learn about yourself. Welcome to the Zero Quit Podcast, where we bring you inside the minds of elite athletes, business owners, specialists, and other creatives. I'm your host, Brock Covington, and through these conversations, you'll hear practical advice and effective strategies for optimizing not only your performance, but also your habits and routines as well. If you enjoy the show, be sure to subscribe and share it with a friend. What's going on, guys? So today, I have the pleasure of having on Bo Dorning, along with Ruthie Massman, who are the owners and founders of V23 here in Southeast Denver, Colorado. How are you guys doing? Good. How are you doing? Doing good. It's an early morning, but it's going to be a good one. And this, you know, it's interesting. You know, we were going to do it post workout. So I feel like I was going to be, you know, a little more like relaxed, kind of exhausted. <laughs> but now I got the thought of, you know, what I'm about to do, you know, and go through with the workout. And I never know. Here, the last two weeks, we've done a lot of like Olympic movements that I have zero experience with. So, you know, there's more of those coming this morning. Too. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have to think or keep that in mind. So I want to dive right into opening up this facility. So you guys opened up 2018, right? Yep. Yep. 2018. Gotcha. So Ruthie, you previously had experience with uh, managing at CrossFit Chaos, is that right? Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yep. So what was that experience like and what kind of takeaways did you have from that experience that you kind of carried into how you wanted to structure and open up E23? Yeah, I am. Um, I got really lucky with having a great business mentor. So mm-hmm. Um, the quick backstory is I worked at a marketing firm in Breckenridge, mm-hmm. um, and That's kind a, of interrupt you. Hold it a little bit closer. Oh, sorry. Thank good. you. Um, worked at a marketing firm in Breckenridge, mm-hmm. had the opportunity to consider whether or not we would purchase that from the old owners and got me rolling with the idea of if I was going to put all the time into running a business, yeah. right. And have more invested in it than just working somewhere. What would that look like for me? And it just turned into being a gym. So I went to Fort Collins, back to Fort Collins from where I grew up, um, and a gym I had worked at for 10 plus years uh, as a personal trainer and group fitness stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and the owner decided that he was like 100% in on taking me up on opening a CrossFit gym. So mm-hmm. it was in the same complex. Um, and the takeaways I got from that were amazing because he was like my business mentor. Mm-hmm. He owned a 100,000 square foot, you know, Gold's Gym style gym. Yeah. Um, and gave me access to meeting with him every week on how to structure the business. Um he gave me the marketing department to help run. He gave me the billing department. So I got like a really amazing four-year education yeah. from him on yeah. like what's the best successful way to run this. And I feel like the best experience you can get is from, you know, mentors rather than going through general schooling or traditional schooling. Right. Because it is like those more experiences actually in the field and in the practice that are a lot more applicable and a lot more honest than, you know, you're going to get probably on an online course or in, you know, schooling, like I said. Yeah. And even with a four-year degree, I still learned more from him than I had from my entire four years in school. Yeah. So for me, the biggest takeaways were that it had a lot less to do with fitness and a lot more to do with how do you make sure the the back end and the business side of um, a gym was successful? Yeah. Okay. And then, Bo, you obviously have had close to, I think, two decades of uh, coaching experience and things like that. Where was your headspace and kind of motivations behind going in with Ruthie on opening V23 and what you wanted to get out of it? When Ruth first started training with me, this was 2016. Um, I'd been in the industry long enough to know what I didn't like about the industry, which is I I hate to put it in a negative context like that, but I think you – when, when people get into this business, they, they have an idea of what they think a gym is supposed to look like, but I think it's important to have the experience. I think knowing what you don't like is equally as important as what you like. I don't see that in a negative aspect. So I've been around the industry a long time. I've done, you know, the traditional bodybuilding stuff. I've done endurance, competitive CrossFit. By that time I was doing powerlifting, started dealing with strongman. So, you know, when we got into V23, 
it was more based on rather than us telling our athletes what they have to do and how they have to train. It was more about curiosity and asking people questions. What do, what is your peak physical expression look like? Mm -hmm. What, what drives you to the gym? What's going to help you live a more powerful life? And for a lot of people that may not be kipping pull-ups or running a marathon or picking up a 300 pound stone, but it was important for us to ask the questions like loyalty goes both ways. So it's like, if you're going to have these people come into your gym, you know, repping your brand and your business, I think it's important that you ask enough questions like, Hey, what can I do for you? Mm -hmm. All good relationships start with that conversation, not just a transaction. And that was very important to me. And I'd been around a number of businesses and a number of cultures to where, and I've heard business one of the, one of the turning points for me actually was in 2000, late 2014, early 2015, a gym owner who wasn't a coach, right? Who wasn't in the strength and conditioning, wasn't in the thing. Um, literally sat us down and was like, people don't care if they get better. People just want the best hour of their day. Mm -hmm. And that, like, I looked around at the room of people that, and no one had flinched. And I was like, I care if I get better. <laughs> I, I'm the boots on the ground. Yeah. I'm the one looking these people and I'm responsible for their results. Yeah. Every single person under my, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's me it's aspiring mm -hmm. leader. All of these people very much care if they get better. And here was somebody who ran the business, who was responsible for the culture, who was looking at a group of coaches saying, no, you just have to give them the best out of the, out of the day. They don't care if they get better. And to me, not only was that not, would you say that as a gym owner, would you ever say that in front of your athletes? If you're, if this is what you're telling your coaches, yeah. are you, what if, what if you put that on your Instagram? Well, Guys, these people don't care if they get better. They want the best hour of their day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you nailed kind of, especially as a, as an owner, you can see how that trickled down and why they didn't flinch because that's the standards they've probably set at that gym and the culture they've kind of cultivated. And one thing I like that you kind of were talking about and how I thought about it too, when opening um, our gym was, you know, upfront, what do you like about certain gyms you've been to? What do you don't like? What do you want the culture to be like? What kind of principles and kind of key core values do you want to open your gym with? And I think there is that problem with a lot of culture nowadays with most group exercise places like an Orange Theory, uh, you know, not to pick them out, Cycle Bar, you can throw out different things, right? Where it's not about giving people constant progress or even personalized progress. It is just, hey, let's just burn calories, have fun, post a picture, whatever. And uh, it, it's definitely not kind of what you guys have here. And another thing too with CrossFit gyms, I think sometimes is very – um, I don't know, it, it can get stereotyped or be by the book in a certain way. And I think there's certain elements to this place that you guys have built in that don't scream uh, CrossFit or stereotype. You know, I think one thing that you know, you've had throughout your Instagram and things I've noticed here is the, you know, against having the whiteboard. Uh, another thing, too, is, you know, you guys are tied to CrossFit, but I don't come in here and think of this as a CrossFit gym. It's more of like a strength training facility. You guys have different people doing different stuff in here. And the attitude is very much community um humility and then just overall just embetterment you know how can we get better in this and i think that's you know culture you guys have thought about and i guess are there any ways that you've things like getting rid of the whiteboard of those mindsets or mantras that you guys have tried to tie into the culture from the start to create that i think i think you know number one culture is and that's where i I don't nitpick. Um, this isn't a bashing CrossFit or bashing F45 or bashing yeah. Orange Theory. Um, it has nothing to do with the actual modality. It has to do with the leadership and the culture. Yeah. Like, what do you incentivize? What carrot do you dangle in front of that athlete? Is the carrot you're dangling to do stuff faster and worse and just try to beat the person next to you? Or are you incentivizing virtuosity? Are you incentivizing humility? Are you incentivizing... Um, the care that it takes to maybe back off and slow down today, knowing that it will pay dividends later. So you're not just going hard every day. So I think gym owners need, and this transcends just the athletes. Like, what are you incentivizing with your coaches? Are you incentivizing care? Are you incentivizing attention? Or are you just hiring some dude who has a 270 pound snatch that went to regionals in 2012? Is that what you're incentivizing? Or are you incentivizing your coaches to actually improve, to be students of their craft um, and to actually ask questions of their athletes and want to know how they can better serve them? Well, that's just very quick, Adam. One of the yeah. things um, when we first opened, talking about the culture piece, 
Uh, we made more of an effort on paying attention to what was happening within our four walls. Mm -hmm. A lot of gym owners I've noticed get caught up in what other people are doing, right? So it's, oh, that gym charges this much. We should charge this much. That gym is running this program. Maybe we should run this program. And instead of focusing externally, you know, like that culture piece came from us actually like, why not pay attention more to what's going on in here? And that gave us a better idea of, you know, how to control the culture. Yeah. I love that because, you know, I don't know how similar this is to you guys, but you know, you made me think about when we opened up, there was actually another gym opening up probably about 20 minutes from us closer to the city. Um, different vibe a little bit. We were more, you know, bodybuilding, powerlifting, overall kind of strength training. They were definitely more bodybuilding focused and more hype, more clout, uh, more, you know, cliches tied into how they kind of market and push things and more ego pushed, um, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, Instead of trying to, you know, keep up with the Joe and just compete with them, try and match everything they do. Oh, they got this cool neon sign. Let me get that. Or, oh, they got these machines. Let me get that. It was sticking to our guns, sticking to our, like, you know, roots. And one thing, too, that I think we kind of happily lucked into, and I think you guys, uh, you know, you might have more structure to it, but I think lucked into it in a way due to the fact that you set the standards early on and set these certain certain vibes and how you guys are going to treat each other around here is getting the right people in, um, you know, getting the people that aren't going to just uh, leave cable accessories on the ground, that aren't just going to leave weight unracked, that aren't just going to leave trash on the ground. Uh, how do you guys kind of go about that process? Because I'm sure sometimes you do get the, you know, world-class athlete that comes in and just wants attention, d doesn't, you know, allow himself to be integrated into this kind of culture and how do you kind of go about okay i do want everybody and i want these people that can bring attention but i don't want people that are going to detract from our community and i don't want to just kind of say all right we don't even want your business you know i love this question i, I love because there's, sure there's so many layers like, it, yeah. like this podcast can't be four hours long so i kind of have to decide <laughs> how to prioritize this yeah. because those athletes don't last here yeah number one Good. Yeah. um they just don't and if if what we incentivize is I don't care how good you are. I, my only concern is how good you want to be. So that transcends any athlete we have in here, whether you need to lose 40 pounds or whether you're the quarterback for a professional football team or whether you're a strongman national champion. Um, for our coaches, like you're not your resume, you are your work you are your results right now, right? So for our athletes, it's the same thing. If you come in here, like I've been, I've been in the gym for a long time. I've seen world record deadlifts. I've seen world record Atlas stones loaded. I've seen some of the best plyometric, some of the best jumpers in the world jump. And none of that is as impressive as somebody who is willing to commit to lasting change, right? So that doesn't, whether you need to lose 40 pounds or whether you have, um, you know, incredible goals outside the gym, it's like, our product, and, and I, want to, I want to lead this into value yeah. and kind of what you were talking about with your gym. Um, Logan Gelbrick from Deuce Gym, if, any, if anybody's not familiar with him, phenomenal mentor. You know, he talks about asymmetrical value, and it was like everybody, you can hit a golf ball to 20 other gyms from here, and everybody's trying to compete to have the harder workout to be more hardcore, and it's like, guys, PSA. We don't need to make high intensity training any more intense than it already is. By default, even in the name, it is high intensity, right? So what is our, our uh, you know, it's kind of a joke, but it's, it's a truth where you pay, people here pay for coaching. The workout is free. Let's say that again, right? The workout is free. People pay for coaching because you can take our workouts. You can take, you can recreate this facility. You can recreate the polished concrete floors, the black mats, the cinder black walls, or the cinder block walls. You, there's not a gym around here that can compete with our coaching, period. Yeah. So that is our product. Our product is not workouts. There's YouTube videos, hundreds of thousands of hours, millions of hours, how to get a 600 pound back squat, how to climb Everest barefoot, how to hold your breath for seven minutes. Why can no one do this? Yeah, can I hold you on that? Please, I want you to keep rambling, please. but that is exactly what i told my wife and what i told other people when you know other gyms in the area are getting you know this fancy equipment these fancy machines i was like we can buy the exact same stuff have the same exact structure here we aren't them and they aren't going to be us because it is the culture you know us as owners the different 
elements, the people, honestly, that we have, the demographic that we bring in that makes us different. It's not just going to, you know, a gym isn't just four walls and equipment. You know, it's the people inside of it. It's the cult you have there. And like you said, the level of coaching you have. Yeah, it's, I, I use a lot of metaphors in the restaurant business because that's what my father did. And that's kind of the, what I grew up on. And it's like, I think the fitness industry is very similar to the restaurant industry where people are born with this gene to where they're like, it would be really cool to run one because I'm passionate about fitness. Do. Who yeah. doesn't love food? I should obviously open a restaurant, right? <laughs> also, being on a pedestal, telling other adults what to do with their time and their day. A lot of people enjoy that. That's an absolutely horrible reason to get into this industry is to be on the pedestal. Um, but when people like just the restaurant industry, what do they focus on? They want to have the nicest plates, the silverware, they want to have the, the ambiance and the theme. And it's like, that's all good to get people in the door. But if your food sucks, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be yeah. pretty short. So you need to focus on your product. So defining this, you know, when Ruth and I sat down and put this together, it's like, what is our product? Our product is coaching. That's our product, the workouts. Uh, and by, because of that, we can coach our product. Like if coaching is our product, we can coach whatever we want to coach. We can coach strongman. We can coach powerlifting. We can coach endurance. We can coach high rocks athletes. We can coach mental skills, nutrition. We can coach all of these things because that's what we do is we coach and we have the staff and the training and the knowledge base to coach any of these. So why would we limit to define ourselves, if we just want, if our goal is to get other people better and help them find their peak expression, why would we limit that to one modality? Mm. When it's it, one of the beautiful things about, you can walk into this gym at 4.30 p.m. and you have a strength class who's throwing, they're doing conjugate method speed work and atlas stones. You have a group of CrossFit competitors who's doing Olympic lifting. And then you have a group of of you know our, our general population athletes doing you know the wad and the workouts and it's like everybody there's not this weird clicky thing it's like yeah. everybody's a, we're unified under this v23 flag where everybody in this gym knows everybody else is pushing themselves to get better and that's all they care about like it's it, it honestly man it's like it's lost on me it's lost on ruth oftentimes but um it's not lost on our athletes it's pretty special yeah clicks are very common in gems it's weird and, uh, yeah, I don't know. You want to add something? I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking, like listening to Bo and thinking about your original question on like, how do we do that when you have people come in here? It works itself out. I was going to say, sometimes it it's really not, does. it's not a, oh, here's my step plan. It's just how you act and the consistency you kind of have over time. Yeah, and you know, the culture we created, yeah. it's the people that are here will already weed that out. It's, you know, so if you have someone come in here with a massive ego, that's not that wants all the attention or that's trying to take up space. Like it, we, we don't support that, not by saying anything, but it's blatantly obvious if someone is here for, for different reasons than why we're here. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing we have to do. And you've, you've seen that in like small ways, yeah. put the rower away. And if it's not in the way that they, you know, our members were trained to do that, they will come tell you like, <laughs> Hey, that's yeah. not how this goes. Right. And it's just pretty cool given the fact that, you know, we're here a ton, but we're not here all the time and we could leave for a month straight. And I would not hesitate to think we would come back to the same setup and the same culture and the same type of people without that getting out of hand. Yeah. It's, you know, we, we call ourselves a tribe mostly because of the culture aspect. So when a, a culture in and of itself is it's become self-policing yeah. to where the athletes. So I, I want to tell you a quick story. When we took, I won't go the full backstory, but how Ruth and I came into this was, it was pretty unique. I was working with some NFL athletes at the time. Ruth had shut down her gym, moved around, had moved back to Denver. And then we connected through there, started training together. I was in the midst of the place I was at was a phenomenal opportunity, horrible culture, horrible to to toxicity, working with some ex-professional athletes. And um, so Ruth and I decided we put our heads together. We were dating at the time. And that uh, both of us wanted to do this thing. I just lost my train of thought. Went too far off. I can pick you up um, there if you want. Oh, so so we ended up no. So so we ended up so we we bought it. We bought a gym. Phenomenal owners who got into the industry like a lot of other people do. Now we had no connection with them. Um, but funny story. I can't make this up. I found it on Craigslist where I put an ad out. Ruth didn't even know I put an ad out because I was looking at uh, at the time we had some people willing to write us very big check, very big check to open up a gym up north. Um, when somebody holds that type of money over your head and wants to open like a super facility, 
it's very exciting, but then you realize there's no free lunch. And at yeah. some point, because the culture aspect was so important to Ruth and I, I didn't want anybody else's hands in the cookie jar. There's a bigger these... demand to make money now and put profit over people. And yes. culture. It's hard to turn down millions of dollars to run a, what, what is built up as like, wow, this is a dream. Like yeah. we don't have to start from scratch. We yeah. don't have to struggle. You mean you're going to give us 50,000 square feet to do whatever we want, you know, and a, a lesser intelligent person would probably yeah. jump on that without thinking about what Bo too much saying. money and too much space can be dangerous. Yeah. And then because you have yeah. to fill it and then and then somebody else. What what happens with that? It's like, oh, you better you go discounted memberships. You go class pass. Yeah. You go all of these ways, which are a shortcut straight to the bottom, because that is what you end up competing in is price. And as soon as you compete in price, it's a race to the bottom. But one thing we know about any industry is there's always room at the top. It doesn't matter what like whether it's the vehicle industry, there will always be Lamborghini, mm -hmm. right? Fitness industry, for me, in my opinion, there will always be V23 because all these other places, these mid-market, they're always just, it's gonna become a race to the bottom. And that's, I don't know whether it's the fact that gym owners don't have enough time or faith in their product and they, they want the quick win, they want the quick buck. But going back to, going back to the story is, we took over this gym um, Christmas 2017 and, um, few days later, I had been training this group, you know, and these are the old school V23 athletes. It was all conjugate strength, speed, um, small, very intimate group, about 12 to 15 people. Um, and then this new gym's athletes who, like I said, phenomenal people, the owners, one was an engineer, one was a full-time nurse. And they're like, oh, you actually have to, number one, play business for money and two, take this seriously. So we took the gym, we, we bought the gym from them. And for the first few weeks, it was like this standoff of their athletes and our athletes, because our athletes were, when we come in, we have up to three, we have up to three minutes at the board. They line up for their warm up. They, I, I'm, I am not going out on a limb here by saying that I honestly think our athletes know more than a lot of coaches because we teach them. So when, when our crew came in and lined up, you know, the other athletes, they had never even been put through a warm up before, right? It was like, kind of like, oh, I'm going to set the clock for 12 minutes, go do the thing and then come back and we're going to work out. Um, so there, there was, you could tell there was a bit of a well, lack of a key discipline part of there. coaching too is a lot, you know, coaching isn't do this, go. It's actually, you know, process of educating the client as well. At least, you know, high quality coaching is. Yeah. And um, so it was funny because it was like you had our group and then you had the, the old gym group. And it was it, that's exactly what happened is like they started teaching them how to put the rowers away. And, and then it became like they became mentors to the newer athletes and integrated them. So Ruth and I didn't have to say very much. We could just stand back. So when it comes to that, where culture becomes self-policing, circling back to what you're saying, athletes that come in here that just want to move poorly and put up the most weight, our athletes call them out and be like, hey, dude, you need to take weight off that bar because that's how we communicate. We have to, you know, disconfirming information with getting feedback. Like you, the, if you want to get good at anything, you need feedback, right? And that's, there's, there's a, a question. Um, would you rather have great training partners or a great training program? A hundred times out of a hundred, I would rather have great training partners because that's the best gyms in the world. That's what you do. I just left. Uh, I was out. In, I was invited out to Westside Barbell for a, um, a very small, intimate training session, which was absolutely phenomenal. The pull-up bar that we use and that they've always had at Westside Barbell is a bar, literally a barbell, electrical taped to the top of a power rack. It's the least. The place is clean, but it is the single least fancy gym. Yeah. I've ever been in in my life. There's dumbbells all over the floor. There's rusty steel plates. Sometimes those are the best gems. Those How, like and they've pumped rusty out gems, some yeah. of the, not only some of the strongest athletes in the world, but the education, like people can say what they want to about conjugate method and Louis Simmons. He's contributed more to the strength and conditioning innovation world too. than yeah. in innovation than any other, than almost any other entity out there. Right. And it's like, yeah. they didn't do that by having the nicest silverware. No, they, yeah. And it was all training partners like that's that gym had a culture, whether you agree with the culture or not, doesn't matter. Yeah. But you can we can all agree that they had a culture and that culture was grit, hard work. I'm not saying that we get in fights over benching here. Right. And we start like knocking each other out. And, yeah. you know, when you have your trach in or you have heart surgery, you're you're squatting you're next, seven yeah. bills and you're <laughs> up next. But there's a level of like, hey, like you're expected to you're expected to show up. 
when, when you when you train here. And the nice thing about you know we're not a neighborhood gym, we're a destination. You know, I rem- I remind myself and I remind my athletes, and I think we thank our athletes a lot because they pass twenty other gyms on the way here to drive here every day, and that's not lost on us. That's something that gym owners have to remember: is your athletes are passing other gyms, other strength of places that are more convenient, they're easier to get to, and they're cheaper to come train at your facility. That can't be lost on gym owners or coaches. So to kind of still piggyback off the gym, but get into a more personal side with, you know, my experience with my wife managing the gym, how do you guys go about not only owning the gym as a couple, but also seeing each other 24-7 almost, and, you know, balancing that you know, knowing that, you know, disagreements or, you know, stress of work doesn't come home, you know, in private life and also balancing like alone time. Because like I said, you know, you're at home, you see each other, you come here, you see each other, you know, it's just this constant cycle, right? Um, I mean, five years of practice at it <laughs> yeah. has helped, but I think it's one of those things where our strengths in running the facility, we put in specific areas where we do overlap some in some places. Um, I think the important parts for us has been to make sure it's, you know, like Bo is fantastic at running social media. Mm -hmm. My degree is in marketing. I can do that too. He does it way better than I do. Right. So it's one of those things where I think there's a lot of, um, you just, you have to define a lot of what your roles are going to be. You know what I mean? And then that's just kind of how that works. And then the rest of it, you just figure out as you go. Um, what I can say on, on the personal front, um, for example, every day I, go outside by myself for like at least an hour Mm -hmm. right because without having some time alone because like you said like i'm either here or i'm at home Mm -hmm. and he's either here or at home so we're we're together i don't know all the time all the time all the time um so for me that's (laughs) it's mandatory i wake up i have coffee alone i podcast alone if we're home together in the mornings we actually don't hang out yeah like bo's in one room and i am in a separate room yeah right and i have my own alone morning routine Well, I think that shows, you know, a high quality friendships, but it's certainly it's extremely important relationships to where you don't always have to be doing a certain activity or be on a date to actually enjoy time together. You know, you can both not only, you know, accept and appreciate each other's interest in alone time, but, you know, have that in where, you know, you can go off in your own room. He can go off in his own room, do his own thing. And no one's, you know, feeling like they're not getting the adequate attention or anything like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it doesn't go without struggle. For the, sure. Yeah. What you said about not taking work home, right? Like, yeah. like having what happens here separate from what happens at home, I would say is probably one of our biggest struggles. Where sometimes it'll be, you know, eight thirty p.m. and both of us are trying to wind down and go yeah. to bed, and I'll be, I'll bring something up like, oh, did you, <laughs> did you think about this? And he'll have to be like, hey, like, I don't want to talk about that. Right I'm clocked now. out. You know? Yeah. 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 So like, there's the constant reminder for both of us, like, hey, like. We're, we're done. We're yeah. done with that conversation. Um, and I think that's going to be a struggle forever because I don't think that ever goes away. Yeah. yeah. It, I mean, period. It's hard. Um, but <laughs> business is hard. Yeah. Um, relationships are hard. Put the two together. What do you expect? I mean, there's no way to church this up. There's no way to make it sound fluffy or, or rosy. Like, there's just not. Um, I think what I've learned the most is having it's been dealt a really strong dose of humility as far as, and this is for coaches or business owners, just because you're really good with business doesn't mean you know how to coach. And just because you know how to coach doesn't mean you should run a business, right? Um, and both of them are necessary, but not sufficient of themselves, right? In my opinion, in my opinion. Um, so where Ruth and I have had to balance a lot of stuff out, obviously we had a vision of what we thought this would look like, and it doesn't look like that yeah, at no, all, it never right? Does. It never yeah. does. <laughs> And so it became, you know, you put your third baseman at third base. I'm obsessed with leadership. I'm obsessed with culture. Um, I coach because some of my first, and I was an engineer previously. I've had a, a, a grab bag, a sampler platter of careers. But one of the things I've always loved doing is coaching. And um, Ruth is phenomenal. Ruth's also a great coach, but she's way more organized than I am. I'm, I've, I've, I think I've paid two bills since I've been here, right? So not only is she handling the floor, she's this, she, you know, I apparently come across as kind of cold and unapproachable sometimes, <laughs> right? Is a 225 pound tattooed dude with the, with the man bun. Like not everybody wants to open up for you, but Ruth 
you know, can kind of be the face there. She can smile. Everybody loves her. Yeah. So we also balance each other like that out where, and honestly, the, the funny thing, the paradox is that people think like she's good cop and I'm bad cop. Yeah. And in reality, she's an absolute savage yeah. and I'm much more like patient <laughs> and understanding. That's how but my people wife just look, you know, too, she's, yeah. she, Ruth is an absolute killer. Like I wouldn't, you know, if yeah. I wasn't married to her, I didn't live with her. Like I wouldn't trust her at all knowing what yeah. I know about her. Right. But on the other side, it's like, that's where we balance each other out, whether we like it or not, because sometimes, you know, it's, I can't, the challenges that she faces are different than the challenges I yeah. face, but you have to understand that the other person is also having challenges, right? Yeah. Whether we can do anything about it right now or not, I don't know, yeah. but it's just trying to communicate and turn the having like, and I'll, I'll, I'll like to get real personal here. It's, um, find like when we have to discuss something, we get in the shower, like the shot is for some reason, it just became a thing. I don't even know if we had had the business yet or not, but it was like, we could always communicate there. Right. So if it was, and I think there's some mental reasons, right. Where it's like, when you want to be creative, you go do something that distracts the, the, the frontal cortex, whatever, yada, yada, yada. So it was like, that became a thing where we could openly communicate because we don't want to have arguments in bed. We really don't, we don't want, you know what I mean? So it's like, if we need to hash something out, like that seemed to be a space for us to do it. Um, and I think that's important to like have some, if, for people that have done this before, like have some type of, of, I hate to use the term safe space, but it's like have a place to where it's like, this triggers you to openly communicate. Yeah. I think, and that could be with anything, right? Yeah. Not just your, not just your lover or your wife or your husband. Well, yeah, I was gonna say the biggest thing I kind of take away and there's a lot in all that, but the biggest thing was, you know, I think having a relationship, the, the, the one big pro to, uh, opening a business with, you know, your partner is if you have a good relationship, you have a good base for business as far as knowing how to delegate roles to each other, you know, and then, you know, knowing how to just, I don't know, balance and, and appreciate, you know, who's better at one thing rather than the other and knowing that it'll be get, it'll get taken care of. Uh, so now I want to pick on both of you. I will come to you. I want to come to you first since you already got the mic in your hand. One thing you said to me last week that, uh, you know, I, I thought was a great, interesting point is you talked about how squatting 600 pounds isn't that hard, but becoming the person who can squat 600 pounds, that process and that journey is the hard part. Can you expand on that and kind of like the mindset behind that? I think I, it all boils down to kind of a results driven mindset versus a process driven mindset. And <clears throat> it's it, 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 that whole, what I just said, those last like eight words out of my mouth sound very cliche, right? Cause there's books written about them and it's easy to post a meme. What a quote, <laughs> right? You're like, Oh man, yeah. like everybody can look at me now. Cause I'm a, I'm a growth mindset person. It's like, <laughs> are you? Cause I don't know a lot of growth mindset people that declare that. Yeah. It's like to, the life coaches at Because everybody else is like, I am in a process of becoming because they're trying to refine it. So I think, you know, the act of squatting 600 pounds, we're just, the number's arbitrary. Somebody who's capable of squatting 600 pounds, like when I, like a perfect example is like one of my strongman athletes, Darren, he did, I saw him for one of his, uh, for one of his recent competitions in 60 seconds, he got like eight axle squats at 600 pounds, um, in 60 seconds. And I was like, Oh my God, like that's a whole lot of weight. But I know Darren, I know Darren's capability mm -hmm. and only, well, Darren and I know whether he would have been good for eight reps. Really Darren knows, but me as his coach, understanding how his body moves, his mindset, like that's only impressive if that was Darren's absolute max effort, mm -hmm. right? It's not that impressive if he has that for 20 reps. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> What one person's 600 pound deadlift is somebody, it's somebody else's five times a week. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's like, that's relative, <clears throat> but somebody, there's some assumptions you can make yeah. about somebody who squats 600 pounds for reps like Darren, yeah. you can assume he's done this a for a long time, B for a long time without injury. Cause the only way you get to that point Avoid is if you haven't messed yourself back. up. Yeah. What does that lead you? Probably he's probably has some humility. He's probably failed a lot. So can you become the type of person that can put in the work ethic, the commitment, the consistency to get your diet in check, to not overtrain, to do this for a decade mm -hmm. and not get injured or incapacitated? Yeah. 
that is impressive. The act of Darren coming in here and squatting six or 700 pounds yeah. is not impressive. Same thing if we talk, let's just use an assault bike. Well, like, I, I can give my own example. Please, to please do. In, was, that was actually one thing I kind of told myself, and I don't know if I have it recorded somewhere, but one thing with uh, my 50-mile race was because I'd never ran an ultra marathon. My past marathons, I've done them, but I'm not super fast. So a lot of where I was going into that race was – to run the 50 miles, I'm going to have to be a person who can run 50 miles. And Bingo. it sounds simple, but I'm either going to you know, fail this race or by the end of it, I'm going to be the type of person. I'm going to be a, an evolved person of my or an evolved version of myself. And I think, you know, if you look at that 600 pound example or the 50 mile example, you know, these are almost kind of headlines or highlights for people to see. And they kind of have that assumption about the person. But it's what that says about the person's characteristics and what they've had to do or the, the traits they have to have that actually is kind of underlying under that highlight reason or that headline that's, you know, where the value is taken away from. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Hit the nail on the head and going back to what you just mentioned. Um, oh, again, lost my train of thought again. It's about me running 50 miles. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. So I did, I did a, um, I threw myself under the bus last Christmas. Me and a buddy paddling eighty miles, right? Paddling yeah. eighty miles, and it was like I have no time on the water. I've never, I've only been on a paddleboard a number of times, but it was like, okay, you're gonna do this thing from Bahamas to Florida, and it was like the first thing you do is like, the, your brain first tells you like, oh my God, that's X Y Z, you can't do that, and then you er, hit the brakes. Hold on, what would it take to become the type of person that can? Okay, what does somebody who can do? an 80 mile paddleboard or a 50 mile race. What do they do? What do they look like? What do they eat? Like it's all act, been done yeah. before. Like it's like, how often do they train? How often they've been injured? How long have they been doing this? And then you just put that together. And all of a sudden this 50 mile race doesn't look as scary. You're still scared because there's yeah. a dose of like, it's binary pass or fail. But I think if more, and this is going way off on a limb, if more people had that mission and something that made them hesitate or pucker, but they did it anyway, I think that's how you learn about yourself. Like if you want to, um, if you want to learn about endurance, train for a 5k or a 10k or a 20k. If you want to learn, you know, um, how to get strong, si get a powerlifting yeah. coach and sign up for a powerlifting competition. It doesn't matter how you perform in the event. It matters what you learn along the way yeah. and then what transferable skills you can learn by doing that yeah. that you can then transfer to anything else. And that's if I've had any modicum of success in any of this stuff is because I've tried a sampler platter of not only careers, but um, sporting events from competitive CrossFit, strongman powerlifting yeah. and endurance. It's like now, like I have a lot more flexibility a lot more confidence and a lot more awareness of my own capability, which yeah. leads me then to more clearly define what my peak physical expression is for me. Yeah. And it really kind of, especially with the idea of self overcoming and things like that really ties into, you know, a lot of, um, some books I've been reading recently from, from Nietzsche and he really talks about the ideology of the will to power. And I really think that people really find their true happiness, meaning purpose, and a lot of fulfillment when they are constantly overcoming resistance, when everything is comfortable or complacent, you're not you're not getting that stimulus you need to really feel like you're making progress, you're achieving something. There's that relief when you do, you know, run the 50 mile race, or even if you fail it, if you if you at least made the attempt to overcome that resistance, to push back against, you know, that force, you do get that sense of happiness and, and accomplishment. Uh, so one thing, and I, I won't feel bad about it because you even said it yourself, is uh, you do come across as <laughs> intimidating at times <laughs> or cold and things like that. Sure. Um, but I think, you know, behind that that assumed coldness is is a level of seriousness uh, and urgency and intent with how you view life and, and purposefulness with how you do things. So I want to ask a little bit because, you know, I think we write our captions in a, in a similar way to where – we both try to not just throw out cliches and generic things and, you know, our Instagram posts and not just throw up something like you said that'll just grab some clicks and likes, but actually add a level of introspective, you know, ideas and your perspective on things that can grow to a bigger concept. So what what has kind of triggered how you write your captions, how you think? Is it a lot of reading? Is it podcasts? Is it experiences you've had or kind of how do you approach I guess that kind of, uh, so let me address the first part. Yeah, said words. It. It. So it's like most people see me in the gym, yeah. right? And in the gym, like I, I have a, <sighs> I got this from Brian Peters from mind strong project. 
to where it's like we wear different masks throughout the day, right? And so my coaching mask is one thing. My training mask is another thing. My mask with Ruth is one thing. Yeah. My mask with myself and my writing is another thing. And Are you uh, a mushy and, and sweet with her like I am I'm way more romantic. Yeah. She's, yeah, she's like, oh, I'm way more romantic. Maddie tries to explain to her family way more, even. Way They're more like, romantic. he's not this like hardcore workout all the time guy. Like with me, he's sweet and goofy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and see – so yeah. what, what now what happens but is I end up wearing again. the yeah. training and the coaching mask too yeah. often yeah. because there's a level of agility and yeah. zooming in and zooming out that has to come with that. But when I'm at the gym, like if you, if you, if you're a finance person, and you're doing taxes all day, you're not just like bouncing around super happy. Like, Oh, I love yeah. taxes. It's like you're working. Yeah. So when I'm at the gym, I'm watching movement. I'm training because uh, my coaching the switch mask, is on. Yeah, yeah. My coaching mask, like, there can be a gym of 20 people and it's even difficult to train by myself sometimes because out of the corner of my eye, I see somebody doing an RDL and their right toe is up. When That's the struggle be with being a gym owner. That's you the struggle want to like with being a gym owner. And I'm like, out, yeah. it's been a practice to zoom out. So yes, I do take it seriously. Um, I try to be more jovial and light when I'm outside the gym, which is also a practice, um, which I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm slowly getting better at. Um, but yeah, so for the second portion, I think it's, I operate best in conversation like this, organic from shooting from the hip conversation, no different than my coaching. When I'm coaching, I'm not thinking I'm in a flow state. I'm like, I'm riding the wave. And when we're having an organic conversation like this, I'm riding the wave. When I'm riding though, it's, it's very different because the inside looks very, di I th you know, number one, I think that where a lot of communication is lost is between the thought and then trying to make the sounds with your mouth. Right. And that's where we get ourselves into a lot of trouble in relationships with interpersonal stuff is like, like I, I yeah. I use those words in that order, but I did not mean to use yeah. those words in that order. So I think clarity is important. And when it comes to writing and you have the time, I think it's important to, I think I, you know, I agree with Jordan Peterson. We're writing and communicating is a superpower yeah. and I don't, you know, my writing isn't to evoke some like shock factor. And I, to me, it's just, it's literally how I think, yeah. right? It's not the loving bow. It's not the jovial bow. It's like when I'm sitting down and I'm thinking and processing something, I think, you know, there's a level of effectiveness and kindness. Yeah. Can you be as effective and be more kind, yes, then do it. But does it lose its effectiveness when you're kinder? Yeah. Potentially not, right? So I think it's finding the right spectrum with between reason and kindness. And how right? something and lands. Yeah. And let's yeah. let's face it. I think you know, in my opinion, if we all took life, you know, if we took ourselves a little more seriously, and not use like baby talk and oh, I did a thing, and it's like. Like, use your words, be an yeah. adult. Yeah. So I think learning how to communicate is you can, number one, it resonates with other humans on your level or that you're aspiring to be. Cause my writing by my own standard is just now getting to be like a C plus. Yeah. Right. And that's taken, I can look in my phone from the first note I took to where I can actually show the moment I started caring about communication. Mm -hmm. And it was early 2016. It's the first, I, and I, the thoughts and the novels that I wrote in my head prior to that are, are gone forever. Yeah. So I highly advise anybody out there that does any form of writing um, journal, like get stuff out of your brain on, cause there's still stuff I look back on 2018 and I'm finishing a thought from three or four years ago. Yeah. And that's really cool. And it shows not only how I've tracked and processed my thoughts, but how my own thinking has evolved. Yeah. And some of the things that I said in 2016, 2017, 2018, I'm like, oh, I don't like that bow. I don't like who that I, – I know what that bow was going through at that time. And so it's a level of humility that comes with it to where it's like if we could – if we all had – and I guess social media shows it now. If we all had a track record of things we've said, things we – you know, you're – hopefully you're not held accountable for them now, but it, it – Worst case is you're able to reflect on things and be like, oh, I was in a, I was going through a hard time then, yeah. right? And now maybe I take this thought, maybe it means something different to me now. So I think with my writing, it's a way for me to portray things that 
I hope will resonate with other people who are going through the same challenges. Cause let's face it in however many people are on earth, there's probably, we all share about the same nine to 10 problems. Honestly, if you think about it, whether it's interpersonal, whether it's how we feel about ourselves, confident, we all share like, every human on this earth. We share about the same dozen problems. Yeah. Right. So it's like, I think the thing, a lot of the things that I talk about are, uh, yes, they're relegated to the fitness industry, but it's like, to me, it's things that are in the fitness industry that transcend the fitness industry. Right. Like I, I wrote something about, you know, how we, people try to define laziness by yeah. people who don't work out. It's like, yeah. well, what effort do you put in? Like, let's talk about strength, effort, and exertion mm -hmm. like where where are these another like how you do something isn't how you do everything yeah. just because you can squat 600 pounds are you strong if you lose your temper with your old lady yeah i think and it's you're the yelling people at that traffic all the time they, they take their gym persona and equate it to you know that's like everything they are and they try and basically i don't know elevate their ego or pride just based off that hour or two in the gym right so. and it's like well i know a lot of very successful and very happy people who don't have a hundred pull-ups who yeah. don't do this stuff. So it was like, it, it, yes, they're, I'm sure they're in other industries. I, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know what challenges the law industry has and yeah. how they say how horrible it is and how lawyers aren't the same these days. Yeah. I don't see jujitsu people do that. I don't see literally almost any other industry shit on one another yeah. more than the fitness industry does. And like, that's a whole other conversation I'm yeah. just sick and tired of. Yeah. So it's like, okay, why don't you talk about some things that transcend any industry yeah. that allow more, like you give everybody the same human experience. Cause it's all the same. We all have the same problems. So now picking on you Ruthie, a little bit is that, uh, <laughs> you know, you're definitely the more specialist with nutrition, have more of a, uh, a control over that with uh, B23, right? Yep. So what are some kind of big philosophies or, or, thought processes beside or behind how you approach nutrition diet uh with clients or people in the gym or just people in general sure you know i think um it's so funny nutrition the information for nutrition is completely free and super easy place. to find yeah. so i would actually argue i'm super underqualified or anyone is to work on nutrition if they don't have a psychology degree yeah. because i think 99 percent of what you do is all around the behavior yeah for the person and absolutely nothing to do with what food they eat, right? Because even if I asked any any random person on the street, like what would a healthy what would a healthy meal look like or what would your healthy diet look like, they know, right? So for me, when I meet a client or a person and they want help with nutrition, my first questions in conversation really don't have that much to do with food. It has way more to do with how their day is structured, what their life looks like. And I try to learn more about them as far as what's important to them yeah. in, in the background of them explaining what their day is shaped like. Mm -hmm. So if they get up and they get coffee and they go straight to work and there isn't even any thought for planning of food or what they're eating for the day, or I take time to meditate or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that is indicators for me as far as one, how serious are they about their health? But where is their mental state in relation to how much can I push and support better eating behaviors? Yeah, and it, it, I think it ties exactly to you know what me and Bo have talked about before that the, the information's out there. You know, right. there's all, all, so much information, conflicting studies, but there's just so many things out there that people know what what they should be doing and what they should be eating. But like you said, behaviors kind of are overlooked as far as you know. Do you like eating breakfast in the morning? And a lot of times, too, people forget that intuitive process of, you know, like how I approach it is how does something absorb my body? How do I feel with the energy from it? How do things feel when they digest? You know, mm -hmm. you got to look at it more than just, you know, oh, this is what somebody eats. This is supposed to be good for me versus, you know, some people don't digest red meat well. Right. Other people they go full carnivore and they feel amazing. So I like that you kind of look at the behaviors because how they how they live, how they go about their day when they're not eating or, or at the times they eat definitely has a lot to do with, you know, how they should be eating or how, how they can actually adjust their eating for long-term success. Yeah, and, you know, even with my clients that already eat well, yeah. I do make them start in the, in the beginning first, like, month or two I work with them. I make them actually take notes, like, how do I feel before I eat? What am I thinking how does my stomach feel? Yeah. Okay, how long did it take me to eat my meal? Mm -hmm. What am I thinking during and how do I feel 15 minutes after? Because you you nailed it. Like some people don't digest red meat well. Mm -hmm. um, I have a client who um, 
she's mostly vegan, um, which is a whole separate conversation yeah. we don't need to get into yet. But she didn't realize that like kale wasn't digesting well or her amount of um, sweet potatoes she was eating like isn't sitting well in her stomach until I made her stop and reflect like, how do you feel after that meal? She's like, wow, I actually feel more tired. I actually feel more bloated, et cetera. So 90%, like I don't have... I don't have one diet recommendation. I don't have like everyone eats seven meals a day and every three hours. Some people do really well eating one or two really large meals a day. And if that's how they function best, then it's not up to me to try to change something that makes you feel good. It's up to me to try to teach you, you know, like let's find a habit that's sustainable for your life that is healthy and that you can do without my, without my help. Yeah. I really like that self-reflection part of it because I think, yeah, just so many people just go through life and just eating. And this is the same way even with a lot of things and exercise included. People just kind of almost turn the brain off and just eating is just part of their day and they don't actually ever sit and analyze, why am I doing this? How do I feel in all those aspects? Another thing I like too that, you know, I think not that you shouldn't listen to anyone who is very dogmatic with, you know, this is the diet you should eat and this Mm -hmm. and that. But I think the best coaches, especially for, people you should listen to I would advise people to listen to are people like yourself that don't ascribe to you know only eat vegan only eat paleo only eat you know meat carnivore diet because I think you know everyone's different obviously you know biologically you know and then even with the vegan thing you know you could tie in ethics for why you might do uh, one diet versus another so I think you definitely fall along the lines and you can correct me if this isn't accurate of more flexible dieting intuitive dieting you know seeing what works for you rather than following any kind of linear path on this is exactly what we're going to do. So when it does come to flexible dieting, you know, where do you find the balance or how do you kind of approach the people that say, oh, counting calories or watching what I'm eating is too restrictive, you know, and Mm -hmm. somewhat tied to this body positivity kind of movement versus, hey, a lot of people do need some structure. They do need some restrictions so that they actually have some guidelines on how they should be eating. Sure. Um, Like I said, I don't, it's not one way, right? So some of those people that think like, oh, I'm eating fine. I don't want to count calories. It's too restrictive. Mm -hmm. I will ask them to try it just as a challenge, right? Let's try Mm -hmm. one week. Let's count your food for one week. Can you commit to attempting this as a learning experience for both of us? Mm -hmm. And usually if you approach it like that, like this is not a long-term thing, let's figure it out. They get into it and realize they're way off. Yeah. Um, and you know, the, the one thing that I will harp on with all my clients is making sure they do get enough protein, mm-hmm. right? Out of all things, it's really easy to fill carbs and fat. Yeah. It's really hard to eat too much protein. And I would even argue, I have not had one person ever, ever come to me and say, I have a hard time eating too much or I eat too much protein. Yeah, that's the like, challenge. Dang, yeah. man, like I'm overeating protein. Can you help me? <laughs> yeah. Right. That's not a thing. No. Um, so I'll, I'll push people to, to try and to check it out. And then what you, what you realize is um, they might be making protein choices that have a lot more carbon fat than they thought mm-hmm. um, across the board or they're thinking they're doing well and they're eating peanut butter with every meal and they didn't realize it. Yeah. So I think it does come back to them bringing the, the pieces to their forefront, the awareness, right? Yeah. Um, awareness of exactly what you're doing, what you're eating, why you're eating and so right, forth. Yeah. Right, right. So to wrap up this conversation, I want to ask about, you know, what's next for V23, any kind of big picture uh, events or, or goals you guys have coming up with the facility in the next few months heading into 2023? That's such a great question and something that we talk about um, pretty often. Um, I'll say the short-winded version and I'll let Bo do the long-winded version. <laughs> um, but realistically, I would love to see V23 grow into more than just a gym with four walls. Um, I would, I think the access that you have to change people's lives in in just this facility is not large enough for what I'd like to do. And I'd like to do something where we can spread that message of culture and community and make someone look at their life from a larger than just an exercise perspective. Um, And I don't really know what that looks like yet, but I know that it needs to grow. The culture doesn't need to end once you leave these doors, right? Yeah. And you know, one of our contacts who um, is a great friend who works for Yeti, actually, he kind of asked it would we open another facility and the answer right off the bat was absolutely not and he was like i get that yeah that's how we thought absolutely yeah. not but then he pushed back on that and said you know what like i think that you uh not that you owe it to You're but like it's our responsibility to do it he's like you need to open another facility because we need more of you we need more of this place and it was a really interesting perspective to hear someone who spends their their job is to travel around and make connections in health and fitness to tell us like 
well, that's a cop out. Like you guys actually are hold a responsibility to do better because you know it's, there aren't that. It's just hard to trust that you know, and that's a whole another topic I didn't bring up today. But the idea of delegating, right? And if you open up another location, you're trusting that not only you know, well, yeah, you're not going to have you're trying to have the same culture over there, and it's difficult to be from A to equal A, you know, and you have to be okay with it being B as long as some of the still core values, principles, things, you know, uh, standards are there, right? But when we, you know, we talk about, like, V23 is our expression, right? V23 is our expression. I think, you know, we've run a lot of, like, coaches' development courses. We've coached coaches that coach coaches. We have athlete camps. So I think, you know, what would be a way to do this and expand our message, like, what I want to do is create a platform for other people to succeed, right? And in the process, have V23 succeed. So, you know, if we get into, which we, we're getting back into, we took a break during COVID, but as far as like, can we create a platform where we can bring in other coaches and help, you know, teach them the core tenets of what has made V23 successful, teach them, you know, about culture and leadership, establishing their own voice? Because how many people are in this industry, they don't know what they stand for. They're just trying to be a cookie cutter of the next place. Mind you, they don't even know if that place is financially viable. There are a lot of people with huge, a lot of gyms, huge Instagram followings that aren't turning a dime because they're spending way more than they're making, but it looks good on paper. So how many people are emulating these places without, they, they, they don't know what their books look like. They might have some incredibly wealthy owner like gyms I've been a part yeah, of. That perception's not always Perception's reality. not always reality. So can we make V23 number one? Like I want to protect this space. We will not sell out, right? Um, number two, can we bring in other, like whether there's another V23 that opens up in Austin or San Diego, I don't know. I won't say that now, but what sounds more beneficial to me is can we get other coaches and trainers in here who are curious about establishing their own brand and their own voice and help them open up what their version of V23 is, which is their expression of their culture and what a manifestation of, of how they live their lives. So if that's some type of affiliation thing, like, I don't know, but I know we are in coaches education and that's something that's important to us. Um, second thing is helping, you know, we want to get into helping build brands. We have a beautiful facility here. So we've been having a lot of brands come in doing photo shoots, um, working with other companies on their like kind of fitness strategy for the following years. Like that's, that's the kind of stuff that we want to be doing and then have, you know, coaching will always be a part of what I do. It'll always be a part of what Ruth does. But if we can start expanding and help other people hone their voice while we still have our group here, that's that's you know innovating and evolving every year like that's what i think success looks like to me anyway so so where can people find both of you individually as well as the gym um in uh the gym www.v23.fit um we have a bunch of programs on train heroic in the marketplace uh instagram underscore bo ryan b-e-a-u-r-y-a-n um i met ruthie massman on instagram and the gyms at v23 what's what's our gym instagram uh, yeah, I think v23 so. un, v23 yeah. underscore athletics yeah, yeah they yep. don't know it but it'll be listed yeah. on the <laughs> yeah. show notes yeah anyway thank you guys very much um for just taking the time to do this i'm looking forward to our workout and uh if anybody has any more questions they can definitely kind of point towards your direction if you guys enjoy the show make sure you uh, i was gonna say like it i don't know if you can like it on here share the show with a friend subscribe to the podcast and we'll catch you guys in the next one